Hello Canada and the world at large. This is Lane from Canada. We're kicking the series off with Congo because to me this film will forever be the pinnacle of that most delightful of 90s subgenres known as even bad movies used to be good. It got dismal reviews, did okay at the box office, and 24-7 I'll take it over the critically acclaimed chum that's been churned out by Hollywood since 2016. And it's produced by that lady who fired Gina Carano. <laughs> I wonder what she's up to these days. Oh, Fade I in. Had a girl and she was good, but one of I her wish legs was made I could put my fist through this whole lousy beautiful Do you love the gentle African gorillas and want to save them from extinction? <laughs> this movie will forever challenge your adherence to that noble goal. Dang! Good night, Tim Curry. It's been a pleasure. So, we've got this Texas tech company called Travicom that needs rare blue diamonds to power a laser gun in order to dominate the communications in industry. 27 years later, I'm still not sure why, unless they're planning to mount it on top of a mountain lair and shoot down all the competitors' satellites with it. They don't really go into detail, but I don't care. They have, they have a handheld laser gun. You stick a blue diamond into a sliding drawer like a K-cup pod, and that somehow saves your tech company. Don't overthink it. Only problem is the blue diamonds are only found in the vicinity of African volcanoes, so a prospecting expedition is sent into the Virunga region of the Congo to find them, led by handsome hero Charles Travis. Hey, that's Ash! This is my boomstick! They luck out and immediately find alluvial diamonds in the mineral springs at the base of Mount Makenko, a volcano that's basically a ticking time bomb for the plot as it's building up to a major eruption. Charles reports back to Travicom HQ, where we're introduced to former CIA officer and former field operative Dr. Karen Ross, a woman so habitually badass that she dresses like Owen Grady while in a corporate setting. The explorer's luck seems to be compounded as Charles and expedition member Jeffrey Weems discover the ruins of an ancient city. Man, this is shaping up to be the best movie ever! The great Bruce Campbell leading an African safari to the ruins of an ancient civilization in an uncharted jungle? Who knows what heroics and daring do await us, bated-breathed audience, as this square-jawed hero faces off with the unknown? <laughs> See, this was a more innocent time when a little bit of expectation subversion didn't have to ruin your entire movie. Bloody hell, bloody hell. Charles' father and Travicom CEO, R.B. Travis, rolls up on his company like a boss, thrilled by Karen's report that the diamonds have been found. Hey, that's Joe Don Baker! <laughs> Karen and Travis activate a remote camera when the expedition fails to check in with their coordinates, but the camp is in ruins and at least seven of the explorers have been slaughtered. As they watch in horror, a large ape-like creature that looks like a grey gorilla destroys the panning camera. Travis instructs Karen to hijack another expedition in secret, fearing that the Zaire government will close their borders to further exploration if word of the massacre gets out. He claims he is doing this to save his son, but Karen warns him that better be the only reason he's sending her. We skip over to a cheerful, peaceful, and decidedly non-BLM Antifa ridden UC Berkeley, where everyone is happy, well-educated, at least 35 years old for some reason, and doesn't appear to smell like adolescent sacks of wet garbage on the sidewalk in August. Oh, the shifting sands of time. Hey, look, it's Dylan Walsh, the top billed actor in this movie. And yeah, he's he, he's in it. Like, he's right there. Moving on. Hey, Grant Heslov, where did that guy go? Dr. Peter Elliott and his research assistant Richard are primatologists who work with Project Amy, a seven-year-old orphaned mountain gorilla who uses VR technology to translate her American Sign Language into spoken English. To the best of my recollection, she is never referred to as Project Amy in the movie or Michael Crichton's original book, but I'm calling her that because every basic bitch white girl name sounds ominous when you stick Project in front of it. Project Amy has learned to finger paint, drawing mostly jungle foliage, but also unusual amber figures that look like an open eye. She also suffers from frequent nightmares. This leads Peter to fear that the ape's captivity is causing her to mentally deteriorate and decides that she must be returned to the wild for her own survival. 
We are then blessed by all the glory that is Tim Curry doing a Romanian accent. Herkema Homolka, formerly of Romania, free now of the chains of Ceausescu, traveling the world doing good. I almost married a Romanian girl, free now from the chains of Nicolae Ceausescu. She didn't sound like that. <laughs> Whatever, Tim, you're a treasure. He offers to fund the expedition to return Project Amy to the same area of the Congo where the Travicom team was lost, having previously been intrigued by your drawings of the eye-shaped object. Karen tries to covertly join their expedition, succeeding when they are unable to procure plane fuel without her additional funding. See, this is the kind of screenwriting coincidence that I love. Hey! Our scientific expedition in the back end of Nowhere Congo just got attacked by a gorilla! <laughs> no kidding! We're going to that exact same spot on the second largest continent on the planet, with a gorilla! This is transposed from the original novel, wherein Peter was invited to join Karen's expedition as she needs a primatology expert, presumably in order to add a layer of mystery to the movie. But whatever, they land in Uganda and we get a Joe Pantoliano cameo out of it, so nothing else matters. Wanna sell that gorilla? No, I do not. Worth a lot of money. Why isn't Joe Pantoliano in things anymore? Seriously, where did that guy go? Have I just missed it all? Yeah, yeah. Bad Boys 3, I know. I never watched it. They're also met at the Ugandan airport by veteran safari guide and gunrunner Monroe Kelly, played rather epically by Ernie Hudson. This delightful bit of casting happened after Kathleen Kennedy realized that she had zero chance of landing Sean Connery, the man for whom the role was originally created by Michael Crichton. No complaints from me, as this was before race swapping characters was the insidious practice that it is today. And with apologies to Ghostbusters fans, Ernie is awesome in this, and this will always be his, be his most iconic role to me. I'd watch an entire spin-off franchise of Ernie Hudson leading jungle adventures and fighting monsters. Let's make it happen, fans. More movie coincidences. While they're literally still on the tarmac, somebody tries to assassinate the president of Uganda on the very same tarmac about 60 yards away from them. I love movies! The assassination attempt throws a turd in the punch bowl, and Uganda goes into full lockdown like they're facing a pandemic with a 99.992% survival rate. To get across the border to Tanzania, our heroes have to bribe Delroy Lindo, a military legend and proud owner of the world's very last brick Motorola from the 1980s. Stop eating my sesame cake. Stop eating my sesame cake! Mm -hmm. At their plane in Tanzania, they meet a crew of local porters and Kahega, a badass with a machete played by an actor who I respect too much to insult by attempting to pronounce his name. Homolka almost drops the N-bomb on Monroe so we don't feel so bad for him later on. But they still have to violate Zaire's airspace to reach the Congo, and the Zairean soldiers are somewhat less accommodating than Delroy Lindo was. <laughs> So it's parachutes to the rescue, the plane blows up, and they're in the Congo. Peter gets a leech on a part of his anatomy that you don't want to get a leech on, and they almost get eaten by hungry hungry hippos, just your basic jungle stuff. Homolka finally tells him his true motivation in funding the expedition. He's hoping to find the fabled lost city of Zinj, whose mines were rumored to be a bountiful source of diamonds to the ancient kingdom of Solomon, the richest of all the rich Jews in the history of rich Jews. Oh yeah, and they also run into John Hawks, who sees Project Amy, promptly reacts like every child in the history of Kmart, and dies. Karen is forced to admit what happened to her first expedition, and says Charles and Jeffrey might still be alive. She suspects that the team was killed by grey gorillas, but Peter denies that any such animals have ever existed. They finally locate the first camp, and quickly discover the ruins of Zinj as well, but HOLY CRAP ARE THOSE LEECHES?! Top left, on the rock. Those things are longer than your forearm, are those for real?! But does anyone go in the jungle ever? In the next shot, we have Grant Heslov sitting in the same entrance, completely unbothered. How could you ever sit down? How could you ever do anything? You put your back up against a brick wall, and there's giant leeches all over the brick wall. This is why I live in a country where the air bites into my face for six months out of the year. Anywho, the discovery of Zinj confirms that Homolka has been absolutely right about everything. Man, that is such a great redemption arc for someone who's been portrayed as a fairly thankless character in all of his preceding scenes. Good for you, Tim Curry. You trusted your instincts, you never gave up after decades of exploration, and I really hope you can finally reap the rewards of your unwavering faith. I doubt this is a very common fan theory in the vein of Boba Fett surviving the Sarlacc Pit, but I personally like to think that Homolka somehow survived and finally found what he was looking for in life. 
I'm escaping to the one place that hasn't been corrupted by capitalism. Space! Our heroes begin searching for Charles and Jeffrey, but are almost immediately attacked by some truly freaking looking gray gorillas, compliments of the late great Stan Winston. Richard and two of the porters are horrifically killed, and Karen introduces the offending ape to a marvelous invention called the Colt 1911. The team quickly sets up a defensive camp with motion sensors, laser barriers, and sentry guns. The gorilla troop attacks, and we get a lot of pretty sparks and things going pew pew pew. They manage to hold the gorillas off till morning, but then find that Project Amy, Homolka, and two porters are missing. The survivors enter the city once more to find their companions, eventually discovering Homolka and the diamond mines. They learn from pictographs on the wall that the gray gorillas were bred and trained as guard dogs for the mines and suspect that they turned on their masters, resulting in the city's destruction and abandonment. We also get a truly amazing bit of movie magic wherein Karen clearly hands the reluctant hippie professor a Glock, shortly after which she proceeds to start shooting with a Luger. It's not quite an Alec Baldwin level of property master mix-up, but come on, how do you mistake a Glock for a Luger? In the mines, they discover abundant diamonds, but are promptly cornered by the Great Gorilla Troop. The freaky apes proceed to play whack-a-mole on Homolka, Kahega, and the remaining porters, who probably had names, families, and unfulfilled dreams. That guy was a cellist because his father was one, but what he really wanted to be was an apiarist. Find that girl you never told. Tell her you love her. Backed into a giant geode, Karen and Peter find the bodies of Charles and Jeffrey, snuffing out our last hopes of a heroic last-minute Bruce Campbell rescue. It's a tough jungle, baby. Karen finds Charles' laser gun and loads it with a diamond, while Monroe and Peter vainly attempt to hold back the waves of gorillas. With their ammunition almost gone, Peter is overwhelmed by the gorillas and cut off from the others. Oh yeah, and then this happens. I know it's dumb, and I still get chills and chuckle every time. The chill-chuckle combo is a rarity in movies these days, and I treasure it. Oh yeah, and then this happens. Put him on the endangered species list. The score in these two scenes is exactly why I miss Jerry Goldsmith. Then, in one final act of movie coincidence, the volcano erupts and wipes out the city that somehow survived at its base for the past 3,000 years. Despondent at their sudden loss of employment, the Grey Gorillas immediately begin kamikaze straight into the lava. I mean, <laughs> I know you're over 40 with no backup, but jeepers, you start by bussing tables, and with a good work ethic, you can make shift manager in a couple months. You have options. Then Project Amy finds a troop of nice gorillas, our heroes find a functioning hot air balloon, and everybody's happy. And Karen blows up Travis's satellite, corroborating my theory that the laser gun's primary purpose is eliminating competition. The end. Do you guys remember the very first trailer for this one back in 1995? From producer Kathleen Kennedy. Whew! She was really up front and center even back then, wasn't she? But credit where it's due, she helped make the best bad 90s action movie ever made, and there's a heck of a lot of competition in that category. Following on the heels of 1993's Jurassic Park, Congo was initially criticized for its gorilla costumes with human performers, as the technology for computer-generated apes, particularly regarding the digital creation of their hair, had not been sufficiently developed yet. But I absolutely love them. The gnarled, scarred faces of the gray gorillas are truly the stuff of nightmares while giving each one of them a distinctive look and personality. The awe and the horror balance each other out nicely as the movie builds to its finale. You love seeing the gray gorillas attack, and you equally love seeing Monroe blow them away with a Frankie Spaz 12. Project Amy is an equally impressive balance, able to show a wide range of emotion without ever coming across as anthropomorphic. And don't forget the hungry, hungry hippos. Those hippos were not real. They look real. On the human side of performances, we've got Laura Linney being appropriately badass, but also considerably more empathetic than her novel counterpart. I'll concede that Dylan Walsh does a good job of playing a book-learned intellectual who's far beyond his comfort zone, 
particularly shown by his obvious awkwardness when he's forced to take up arms and join the fray in order to survive. The standouts are definitely Ernie Hudson and Tim Curry. Their characters are two sides of a coin, but they match each other in charisma. In a summer action movie, the clear knowledge that an actor is having fun with the role is almost as important as the performance itself. I'm guessing Tim and Ernie were having a blast with this one. <laughs> There's no perfection in this movie. Somehow the producers managed to get Academy Award winning, Tony Award winning, and Pulitzer Award winning playwright and screenwriter John Patrick Shanley to come up with this script, and I somehow suspect it was not exactly his passion project. And as much as I love the gorillas, there's plenty of shots where it's obvious that these are stuntmen in hairy suits. But I don't judge a movie by its perfections and imperfections. I judge it by how much joy it's brought me over the years. I was 15 when Congo came out. At that time, I had a serious crush on Laura Linney's dimples, which are deep enough to successfully smuggle drugs through an airport, and I also liked watching manly men shooting awesome monsters. Some things haven't changed almost 30 years later. This was the perfect summer movie. Jungle movies have traditionally had a sweeping sense of adventure and discovery that's hard to find now that safari pictures have become rare. And Congo had the added benefit of just enough horror to push the boundaries of a PG-13 rating. PG-13 movies used to have way more relaxed rules when it comes to blood squibs. Did you guys see Morbius? Yeesh. In a safari film, there is an elation to the inevitable danger and its shroud of the unknown that makes it so thrilling. Whether the explorers are on a quest for treasure or the missing Dr. Livingston, they know there will be an element of danger, but the adventure and hope of it fills them with euphoria rather than fear. For Peter, Homolka, Kahega, and Monroe, this is exactly the case. Peter is confident that he is taking Project Amy to a better life. Homolka is on a search for unfathomable riches. For Monroe and Kahega, this is just another day on the job, but they do the job because they love the jungle and they love the responsibility of protecting their charges. Only Karen harbors the dark secret of their destination. This is where Congo diverges from other safari films. Karen and the audience have seen firsthand the horror that waits them at Mount Wukenko, and this adds to the building tension. Karen may be more inclined to believe that the first expedition was killed by local tribes or militia, but the image of that rampaging ape is something she just cannot shake. She is pragmatic, tactical, and knows that she is headed towards a confrontation with a foe. But even she seems a bit overconfident, believing that sufficient manpower and firepower will be enough to rescue any survivors and bring them home. This illusion is quickly shattered after their first night under siege by an army of apes that far outnumber the human defenders. For once in her career, Karen is facing a foe that cannot be intimidated, dissuaded, or reasoned with, with an intelligence that cannot be underestimated. Although this movie is considered a blend of science fiction, action, and horror, Congo is actually much more of a slow burn than many other films of the same ilk. Current movies need to be throwing jump scares and action sequences at you every 5-10 to 10 minutes, leaving no space for those feelings of adventure and discovery. Every time the American-slash-Romanian characters meet, react with elation and awe to the foreign African landscapes and creatures they encounter, it builds a sense of dread in the audience because we know that this moment is fleeting. There's an impending danger that we cannot ignore even if the blissfully ignorant characters can, and that's what makes a horror movie something you can truly love. Could this movie be made today? Heck no! <laughs> Although the majority of the human characters are essentially monkey fodder, they are by and large considered worthy of survival in a battle against nature. They even make a decent attempt to save Homolka. Look out! Wow, imagine that. Characters with the power to intervene recognizing that they have a moral responsibility to do more than just stand back and watch the white guys get slaughtered. Stop me if I'm wrong, but haven't we been beaten over the head since 2019 with the fact that any iteration of Captain Marvel is literally the bestest ever? Do your freaking job, Rambo. The blue-haired people would never allow animals to be unjustified, hideously disfigured, and pure venom-spewing, baby-eating evil. Also, the white survivors proportionally outnumber the black and are proportionally more likely to have things like names and dialogue. I will admit that this is consistent with the novel, wherein the Porter characters are only ever mentioned by name at the moment they die. Honoring Michael Crichton's stunning legacy of complex character development is now problematic. Also, People come first. Then gorillas, do you agree? People have God-given dominion over Earth and nature, as per the book of Genesis. People come first. Then gorillas, do you agree? Yes. A reasonable take from a UC Berkeley professor. Put him on the endangered species list. 
The only one-liner that everybody remembers from this film confirms that we should kill evil animals because people deserve to live. Put him on the endangered species list. Uttering this line immediately before taking lethal action against a population density center of what already has to be one of the most endangered species on the planet. Put him on the endangered species list. Killing gorillas with what can only be described as the dictionary definition of a slave mind blood diamond. Even bad movies used to be good. And the one benefit of how much movies now suck is that they have dramatically increased my appreciation of the films I grew up with. It's that appreciation that I want to share with you in this series. No matter how much fun it is to rip the new to shreds, it's a lot more joyful to celebrate what once was. Anyway, should Christ tarry, I'll see you in the next video. Jesus loves you. Vote Lane for King of Canada. There was something legitimately fishy about the Captain Marvel box office numbers. And let's make movies great again.